Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, let me try and describe for you what I think goes on every morning at each one of your houses. So here we go. We get up early. You read your Bible for about an hour while having your cup of coffee. Mom and Dad, they get the kids up and get ready for school. There's no complaining. They sit down for devotions, and the kids read, and they follow along, and they ask profound questions that spark amazing conversations about God. And then we get to work and school on time. How's that sound? Pretty accurate? No? Yeah, probably not, right? Let's try again. We lay in bed a little too long, and you feel a little rushed to get everything ready for the day and get out the door for work and get the kids to school. You probably don't do devotions, or if you do some shortened version while scrambling between activities or saying a prayer on the way to work in your car. Mom and dad, they get the kids up, but it's with a lot of protest and not really a great zeal for beginning the day. You're organizing and preparing breakfast, trying to get everybody showered, and then maybe getting everyone to sit down for devotions, but not very often before school and work. And even if you do, they're half asleep and irritable while it's going on, and they don't follow along, and they don't ask questions. Is that a little closer? Yeah, right? Life is not cookie cutter. It's a mess. And the world certainly does not wait to give us the time that we would like to read God's Word, to read it with one another, to read it with our children, to read it with our spouse, and have that quiet time for prayer. It seems our lives aren't naturally conducive to Christ's call to be in His Word and to teach it. Nor, if we're honest, is it the first thing on our minds when we do have the time to do it. Well, today is Rally Day, and Rally Day is the day that we celebrate the gift of God's Word as we celebrate the resuming of the classes of teaching God's Word here at the church. Next week, we start with our Sunday school classes, where we start very little in this endeavor to teach the faith, to teach God's Word. We also have classes for the adults, because We are ever learning in our walk of faith as well, and not only for ourselves, but when those adults have children now, they are called to teach the faith to their children. So they need to be equipped in that task. And it really is a celebration, a great gift we have received from God, because all that we are as the church is rooted in God's word. I don't know if we have any students of history out there, but any time there has been a worldly power or nation that wants to destroy the church, what do they go after? The word. They try to make it hard to get. There are severe penalties if you are found with it because they know that the word is key. Apart from the word... We can know nothing about what God intends to reveal to us. Now we know because that's the case, none of those worldly powers or nations have ever succeeded in doing so, nor will they ever. For it is Christ's church and it will not be defeated. But that does tell us something about the role the word plays. And right now, we live in a country that has largely been Christian in its history and in its founding. And we take for granted the ability to read the word. Not only read it publicly, but in private. Because there are times and places, even now in the world, where that is not an easy task. I took a youth group at my former church to a LCMS youth gathering called Higher Things. And one of the breakout sessions we went to, we had a Zoom, or I guess at that time Zoom was not big, it was a Skype call from a Ukrainian Lutheran pastor who grew up in the Soviet Union. And it was very interesting hearing how the Word of God factored into his life. 
His family wasn't allowed to own a Bible when he was a kid, and if they were found with one, they would be in serious trouble. But his grandmother kept a copy of the Bible in her attic. And so anytime he went to visit his grandmother's, he would go up into the attic and bring a scrap or two of paper with him and write down one or two verses from God's Word so that he could carry it with him in an inconspicuous manner. And I remember sitting there listening to that, and I'm sure the kids that I brought with me felt the same. I've hardly ever felt that way about the Bible, something that is worth such risk to obtain. Now, partially, that's because we are blessed to live in a country where we don't have to do that, thank the Lord. In fact, I bet you many of you probably have too many Bibles at home, and half of them have never been opened. That's the same for me. When you, go, when you go to become a pastor, you usually end up with like 30 of them by the time you're done. I just shared a small portion of my collection of Bible books in the children's message today. So if studying God's Word and being in God's Word is not something that comes naturally in our lives, doesn't come naturally to our nature, How do we do this? Well, I chose the scripture passages today for a reason. Because God has given us his word for a specific reason. So that we may become wise unto salvation in Jesus. That's the number one goal. In fact, if you want to simplify what the scriptures are, they are just the story of God and his people. And God's love for his people, his mercy for them, and his ultimate salvation plan in Jesus. All of those things we would not know apart from revelation through God's word. Now I'm a philosophy guy and so I like to do thought exercises and talk about natural law and all that fun stuff. And they will say in those circles that the most that you can come up with on your own just from looking around in nature And the Bible does attest to this in the Psalms. It says that the glory of nature attests to God. But the most you can come to the conclusion of is that there is a God and that he's a great designer, that he made creation. But apart from that, you can know nothing else about him, his personal nature, his intent, his purpose, the Trinity, the sending of Jesus, unless he reveals that truth to you. No amount of logic and rational gymnastics can give you the conclusion that God loves sinful human beings to the degree that he does, that he sends his son who becomes true God and true man, who lives the perfect life in our place and dies on the cross in our stead and gives us eternal life by his righteousness alone. We don't come to that knowledge on our own. It is revealed to us through this gift of God's word. Which is why when we read it each Sunday, our response is, thanks be to God in recognition of this gift. But our Lord knew that even after Christ's death and resurrection, before he comes again to make all things new, His people would suffer difficulties and trials and persecutions and temptations. All things which seek to separate us from God's word. All that seek to separate us from the truth of the salvation that we have in Christ. So he does not leave us alone. He hasn't just given us his word and left and no longer walks with us and no longer gives us what we need in order to face those things. A week ago, we had a sermon on Ephesians 6 and the armor of God, that we've been equipped to withstand these trials and tribulations and temptations that the world, the devil, and our own sinful flesh wish to throw at us. And so, too, in the task of teaching the faith, he has given us aid as well. Now, I want to point this out because I think with Matthew 28, our gospel reading from today, the Great Commission, everybody's pretty familiar with the Great Commission. But usually our focus is on going and baptizing, which is a good focus to have. Those are important things because God wants to call all of those who 
um, can hear him and, and come to faith to be his children, no matter what nation, no matter what language, etc. But in that same breath, he mentions teaching. That just as much as going and baptizing, teaching is a part of the process of making disciples. For we too are tasked, like our Savior, not just to tell someone about Jesus, hand them a Bible, and leave. But we are to walk together with them as the body of Christ, instructing them in all the things that God has commanded. And he has not left us alone to do that. He ends the Great Commission with these words. Right after he says, Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So how is God with us then? Because I don't know about you, but sometimes when people say, Well, God's with you. It's not all that comforting because I can't see him. I maybe don't really feel like he's there right now because my life isn't going the way that I wish or I'm dealing with some difficulty that I think he could probably fix pretty quickly and he doesn't seem to be doing that. But God doesn't leave us in the lurch with just that promise, although that ought to be enough. He gives us two institutions that he has made and created for the purpose and task of helping teach the faith and remain in the word. Deuteronomy 6 highlights the first one. The first one is the family. If you look back at the reading from Deuteronomy 6, here is how it goes. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That is called the great Shema, the great worship cry of the people of God in the Old Testament something that God revealed to them in the midst of the world of multiple gods and many different pagan gods. Here is this declaration that the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. There is only one. And then the great commandment that Jesus himself points back to, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your might. And these words today, I command you shall be on your hearts. Great big command from God, revealed to his people. Now, what do we do with it? Well, here's where we get some very practical advice. Verse 7, it starts out by saying, You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. A little bit more of a modern translation of that would be, you shall talk of them when your family's together at home, when you're driving on the way to work or school, and when you lie down to go to bed at night or when you get up in the morning. Like pretty practical advice. He's given us the commandments, the things that he wishes to teach us, and now he's giving us when and where and who should be teaching. And this is sort of one of the shifts that I think the church is undergoing right now because it hasn't done a great job recently, at least in our country, of equipping parents and raising them up as the teachers of their children. In fact, we've done the opposite. We've said, drop them off at Sunday school, drop them off at confirmation, and we'll teach them about Jesus. And you can see after half a century of that where it's led us. I can't do that, actually. I have a different call with respect to your children. But God has called parents to be the primary teachers of their children in matters of faith. And it's not a great, complicated task. It's difficult to do. But the Word gives you everything you need. Because all that that task entails is simply telling of the wonders of what God has done. You sit here, a forgiven child of God. How did that happen? Through the wondrous deeds of God in Christ Jesus. And so we must account and tell of those to our children. So that's the first institution, the family, that God has designed and given to us so that we're not alone in this task of teaching the faith, but also so that young people can grow up and be equipped with God's word to deal with the trials and persecutions and tribulations that this world 
will have to offer. The second institution that Christ gives is the church. Where we're gathered here today. Look around. All of these people sitting next to you are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Walking with you on the journey of faith. Helping keep you accountable to Christ. Helping remind you of the gospel truth that is revealed in God's word. Because when you go out there in the world, you don't hear much about grace. You don't hear much about forgiveness. You don't hear that even though you're unworthy, God loves you as you and not because of what you do for him. Those around you here today are people that help in that task. And not only that, but that's why we're celebrating today, gathering around in celebration with God's word and the institution of our classes where this body of Christ comes together to aid parents and one another in the teaching of the faith. So that we're ever acquainted with God's word and with his promises that are revealed therein. This is what Timothy is talking about in his second letter in chapter 3. He says in verse 14, But as for you, fellow believers, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. I love that verse 15. That is the reason we care about the word so much. The reason that it's a central part of our worship service and it's a central part of our study. Because it makes us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That's why this gift has been given. And so we have classes for the adults so that they can continue to learn and grow in their faith. If those adults are parents, it's to help equip them to teach the faith to their children, to be able to articulate their faith in their own words. This is why we have Sunday school, because church and family are meant to work together in that endeavor, to reinforce what the children hear at home and what they hear at church with one another. So they, too, can be made wise for salvation in Christ Jesus. That's the goal. That's his goal for us. That was the goal of the mission of Jesus from the very beginning. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son so that whoever believes in him should have eternal life. And Paul tells us that those who need to believe can't believe unless they hear God's word. So that is our task. That is our celebration. After all, today isn't about heavy-handed warnings and putting you up against a task that you feel impossible to do. For God has granted these institutions for support But he's also sent his son so that you and I no longer live under the law, but under grace. You and I will fail to do these things, sometimes completely, sometimes to do them well. And that's why, again, we come back on Sunday to confess those sins, to hear God's promise in Jesus revealed from the word so that we can continue to strive to follow after him in this command to teach all that he has commanded us. And that's the most important thing to keep in mind. There's a challenge and an exhortation in this command from God to teach the word. And like we started off the sermon with, life is not just going to get out of the way and make it easy. You have work, you have school, you have sports and extracurriculars that threaten to crowd out the time with God's word. Don't let it. For this is the great gift of God for you and for your children and for your spouse and for your unbelieving neighbor. So share that word so they too may be made wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.